Hey guys, so in this video lecture, we are going to be talking about chapter 23. This is going to go over the infections of the urinary system as well as the reproductive tract. Um, fair warning, we are going to see some pretty nasty, um, gruesome pictures, but y'all are nurses, so hopefully y'all can stomach them. So let's go ahead and talk about the basic anatomy of the urinary tract, and then we'll go into the reproductive tract later on. So the basic anatomy of the urinary tract is the kidneys as well as the ureters and the bladder. Those are the three main things that comprise of the urinary tract. There is much more, but we're only going to pretty much talk about those. Um, so what is the job of the urinary system? So the job of the urinary system is to remove waste um, or any excess water or electrolytes that come from the bloodstream and then it gets expelled out in the in the urine. So the kidney and the ureters, that is what's going to be considered as the upper urinary tract and then the lower urinary tract is going to be actual the urinary bladder. So um, so like the kidneys and the ureters, so the ureters are what actually travel from the kidneys to the bladder and then the urethra is going to be part of the actual, uh, it's roughly part of the reproductive tract. But um, for the most part, we are going to focus on the kidneys and the bladder. Okay, so with that, let's go ahead and go into um, the big picture about um, UTIs. So UTIs are um, urinary tract infections. Um, it's very, very common. Everybody's at risk for a UTI because we all have a urinary system. But women, they, they tend to suffer a lot more. They have a higher chance of getting them. And that is solely because of women's anatomy. So women's anatomy is definitely much different compared to men. So um, a lot of women, most likely, we will have one UTI in our lifetime. Um, but there is a good percentage of women that will have reoccurring infections and UTIs they are probably the most common nosocomial infection meaning that you get it while in the hospital and the reason why is because some patients will have something called a catheter and we'll actually talk about that a little bit later but just know that it's one of the most common infections that you can get during your hospital stay. So there are two different types of UTIs. There's the bladder infection or there's the kidney infection. So whether it be upper or lower part of the urinary tract essentially. So the um, one reason why women tend to get more UTIs than men is because of um, the anatomy of where the anus and the vagina is. So the distance is um, different. So men, they have the penis, which is actually um, it's further away from the anus, whereas women, it's only a few centime centimeters, whew, not centimeters, guys, just kidding, a couple inches away, depending on some women. Some women, it's a little bit larger than others, but um, the, the perineum, that area, which is the distance between um, um, urethra opening and an anus is definitely um, smaller in women as compared to men. That's only one reason, but we will talk about another reason whenever we get into the reproductive system. So what is the general pathogenesis of a UTI? So um, most of them, they will start off in the bladder infection for the most part. And then what will happen is that you will actually have an infection that comes from the urethra. So you get um, either through poor cleaning um, or from having a catheter put in, you'll get an infection from your, from your urethra, which is the, the tube that allows urine to come out of your body. So from that urethra, what will happen is that it'll go to the bladder, and then from there, the, the microorganism will reside in the bladder, and then it can actually um, cause an infection in the bladder. Sometimes it doesn't, and your body just gets rid of it. Um, but if that happens, then what can, if you have a bladder infection that goes untreated, then it can ascend um, to the kidneys. So it can travel up your ureters and go to your kidneys. So that's one way. And then, or it can go the other way. 
So meaning that it's a descending infection from the kidneys. So meaning that you started with a kidney infection, but then it went to your bladder. So it's the other way. So descending is going from top to bottom. Ascend ascending is from bottom to top. So the bottom in this case is your bladder, and then the top is your kidneys in, in, this, uh, in this scenario. So that's the general way that it will happen. Um, the most common one that will occur is the, is the ureter infection, bladder infection, because of women. So that's why a lot of times the whole rule of peeing after sexual intercourse also helps because during sexual intercourse there are bacteriums that are introduced to both, to both partners. So that's why it's a very good idea for women to pee after sex because if they don't pee after sex or they're holding in their pee or have proper um, cleaning habits, then what can happen is an uh, infection of the urethra and that can turn into a bladder infection. And then from there, it can go into a kidney infection, which is even more painful than a bladder. So how do we diagnose UTIs? So diagnosing UTIs is normally done through a urine analysis. So meaning that you will pee in a cup and then a lot of times labs are now starting to do something called a dipstick. So they literally take that little strip of paper and they dip it inside the urine and then based off of the color changes will determine if you have um, a UTI so based off of this urine analysis right here so this is like the chart that um, a lab tech will use in order to determine if there's anything wrong so what is considered normal on this scale is right here so the left side of this urine analysis chart is considered normal and anything over further away from the left side, so more to the right, it's considered abnormal. Um, you can do the dipstick or you can actually do a microscope um, examination to see if there's any bacteria present. So that's the most common one. Um, that's pretty much it. Oh, also you can test for UT, oh, not UTIs, uh, STDs. With this so that's actually how you test for chlamydia is through a urine analysis as well so that's mainly for the microscope examination whereas for the UTIs you normally do the dipstick okay so with that what are some general symptoms of a UTI so there was be there there will be some dysteria meaning that there'll be painful or difficult urination there might be increased frequency meaning you're going more often or increased urgency, meaning you have a harder time holding in whenever normally you wouldn't have to. Or sometimes there can be a burning sensation. Or there can be something called a nocturina, meaning that you are waking up in the middle of the night to constantly go relieve yourself. Um, sometimes there could be a fever or some abdominal pain, but normally that's only seen in children. Um, the most common symptoms that you will see if you have a UTI or if you have a patient that has a UTI is painful urination, frequency, and um, burning. A lot of times if there's burning then it's a um, bacterial infection. But with children if you have a child that also has this sometimes they may even present with a fever. So UTIs in general with children. So children are mainly um, at risk because of the fact that they're still learning how to um, understand and how to gauge when to go to the bathroom and when not to. So when children go to the bathroom, sometimes they don't know when they completely empty out their bladder. So when they don't completely empty out their bladder, they're not excreting everything. And with that, if there's microbes present in the bladder, then those microbes are not being expelled. So with that, then the bacteria has the opportunity to continue growing. Or there's postponing a bladder, so they will say like, oh, I don't have to go potty, I don't have to go potty. But with that, they're still holding in urine, which is not good. And that can lead to damage. Um, sometimes that can even go into a kidney infection if it's not treated. And then that can actually later cause kidney um, disease in adulthood if it becomes a routine problem. But generally, as the child gets older and they start learning their body a lot more, then it doesn't really um, cause a problem. So the prevalence of UTIs will decrease. Um, also, with mainly with female um, children, you want to make sure that they know how to wipe properly. So make sure that they know to go from front to back, not the other way, because they also um, 
go number two, if they, um, and, but they also pee at the same time, they don't wipe properly, they might be introducing some fecal matter into their, va into their um, vaginal area, which is, of course, not good because then you're introducing bacteria that should not be, the, be there and can cause um, infection. Now, reoccurring UTIs are classified as having a UTI two or more times in a six-month span or three or more in a 12-month span. So some women, they will have um, reoccurring UTIs. It just depends on the woman. Some women are more prevalent than others. Um, but the main um, factor in reoccurring UTIs um, is incomplete emptying of the bladder. So women, we are a lot of times for some reason, we can hold our, our urine a lot longer than men. Um, also with sexual activity, like I said, just based on our anatomy, it's definitely a lot easier for us to get um, contaminated down there. That sounds really weird, but um, just because of our anatomy, the way we are, we tend to um, trap, um, trap the environment around us a little bit more so than men and then also cleaning habits can increase our likelihood of reoccurring UTIs like if a woman has poor um, cleaning habits that can also put her at risk and then also spermicides. Spermicides can definitely do that because with using spermicide during sexual activity it allows for microbes to live in the vaginal canal a lot easier and more readily as compared to not using spermicide. So spermicide makes the vaginal area or yeah the vaginal area more homey for, for microbes whereas just the normal environment of the vagina does not allow for a lot of microbial growth but with spermicide present it allows it allows the bacteria to be able to feel a little bit more at home and then gives us higher risk. So bacterial UTI infections, those are caused by several different organisms. I believe we will talk about them a little bit, but not too much. Um, but generally, if you have a bacterial UTI, there is a lot of pain and there's burning upon um, urinating. And then also sometimes there's even some discharge present. Um, so men and women with um, with the UTI bacterial infection, it can result primarily from sexual intercourse. That's the main thing is going to be sexual intercourse is going to be one of the risk factors in terms of contracting a UTI. Okay, so with that, let's talk about hospital acquired UTIs. So hospital acquired UTIs are very common. Um, they are probably the most common infection that you can possibly get while you are in the hospital and that's because there's something called a urinary catheter. So this is a flexible tube that gets inserted into the patient's urethra and it is a tube that allows um, draining of the bladder. And with that, microbes can actually grow on the surface of the catheter and the most common one is E. coli but there's also the proteus and then P-arginosa, as well as um, some staph, can also cause it. So a urinary catheter looks like this, if y'all have not seen one before. But what happens is that this tube is inserted inside the patient, whether it be male or female, it can go in either one. And then what will happen is that it'll go all the way up the urethra, into the bladder. This area right here will be inflated with sterile um, with a sterile solution, normally it's like sterile water um, that you get in your catheter kit. And then that will balloon up so the catheter does not fall out and then it sits inside the bladder. And then from there, whenever urine gets collected in the bladder, there is a hole up here on the tube. And then whenever urine is there, it will go in the hole and then travel down the tube into a collecting bag normally. And then depending on the patient, sometimes you will have to um, collect that urine and then run it for test, or it's just simply because they had surgery or they are incontinent, meaning that they are not completely there to be able to enter, enter, um, empty their bladder by themselves. So that is a catheter. So bacteria can grow on this and that can lead to an infection. And then with bacteria present, that bacteria can travel up and cause 
um, an ascending infection to the kidneys sometimes, not always. So that's why it's very impatient if you Im, impatient, very important if you have a patient that has a catheter to make sure that you are doing peri care, meaning that you are cleaning their genital area very well, and then also to stay sterile whenever you are inserting as well as removing the catheter. So make sure you are clean and then make sure your patient is also clean as well. And that can help minimize um, nosocomal UTIs. Okay, so like I said, there are two main types of UTIs. There's the, <clears throat> excuse me, there is the inflammation of the urinary bladder or there is the inflammation and infection of the kidneys. Now, kidney infections are not as common, um, but if you're going to go based off the gender, women tend to be more prevalent to them. But both of them are still very, they're common enough to where you will see them in your clinical careers, but the likelihood is that if you have a patient that has a UTI, it's probably an infection of the bladder and not of the kidneys. Okay, so now let's look at the different anatomy of a men and women in terms of reproductive system. So as we see, the men and women are very much different. Women, our reproductive system is more internal, whereas men, they do have an external piece of their reproductive system. And then also what you can see is that the urethra, which is what travels, so we have the um, pooey. So we have the bladder, which is actually just right up here, so right above um, the penis as well as the testicles. So we have the urinary bladder, but then we also have, from the urinary bladder, we have that um, urethra, which is the tube that urine is traveled down in order to be excreted out. So as we see, this is a very, very long ure urethra, whereas in women, short. <laughs> super, super short. Our bladder is very close to our vagina region, and our urethra is much shorter. And that's another reason why women tend to be more prone. So the bacteria do not have to travel as far as they do in men. So anatomy speaking, men have the advantage in not contracting um, UTIs as well as reproductive um, STDs. So men have the advantage as compared to women, we do not. Okay, so now let's go into infections. So is sexual intercourse the only way to actually get an STD? Um, short answer, no. You can get um, you can get an infection of the reproductive tract without actually having sex. Um, mainly for women, not so much men. So women, we can get a yeast infection without having ever been sexually active in our life. Um, for men, it's mostly true, um, but not always. So in short, no, but there is some gray area. So with STDs or STIs, they're defined as an infection because of sexual activity, and that is of the genital region, including the anus. So that includes the anus is part of the genital um, reproductive system. So some SCDs, they will cause some symptoms, but there are others that are completely asymptomatic, meaning that you do not know you have an infection. So um, even though you are asymptomatic, you can actually still be transmitting an STD. Um, so we will talk about some that are considered asymptomatic for the most part, and then eventually symptoms will occur whenever the disease or infection has progressed later on. Okay, so this is kind of an ugly table. I'm sorry, guys. Um, with this one, this is kind of just going over some of the viral um, STDs that we've already talked about. So we've talked about um, genital warts as well as genital herpes and HIV. So I do want you to know their clinical presentation, meaning I do want you to know their symptoms. I do want you to know what virus, as well as um, any treatment and how is it transmitted, and then also how to prevent it. Kind of like the last unit test, guys. So let's go ahead and talk about these individually. So let's talk about some genital warts. So genital warts is 
is considered sexually transmitted. It is a viral infection. So it is caused by the human papilloma virus. And what it does is that it will cause these lesions. So they're kind of look like cauliflowers or like bumps in the genital region. So in the, in the general region, whether it be on the penal head or on the anus for men, and then for women, it can be on the labia, um, which is the outer part of the vagina, as well as the anal region. So some, for some patients, there are no um, uncomfortable symptoms, so meaning that the warts are just present and there's no pain associated. Although some, some um, lesions, so some of those, um, some of like the skin tags that we see right here, sometimes patients do experience severe itching, pain, or tenderness to the area. Um, the most common um, genital warts that will cause this is pretty much any HPV virus. So any HPV virus can cause a genital warts. Um, the most common is um, HPV 6 and 11. Those are the ones that are the ones that you will most likely see. But there are other subtypes, and that is 16 and 18. Now these two are considered high-risk HPV um, strands because of the fact that they have been linked to cervical, penal, anal, and throat cancer. So that is um, why the, there is a vaccine against the HPV 16 and 18. So if you have a patient that has HPV 16 18, definitely you want to educate them that they are at higher risk of having cancer later down the line. Um, but the HPV vaccine does protect also against 6 and 11, so it does help um, protect the sexually active population against it. And that is actually why you want to give this vaccine before sexual activity so the patient can have the best prevention against it. Um, men can also get the vaccine, so it's not just for women because men are also at risk of developing cancer, and then also it's good just to protect yourself and to protect the population. Okay, so let's talk about genital warts. So we've already kind of talked about this. I'm gonna go really quick on this guy. So genital warts um, is of the um, vaginal, vaginal, <laughs> sorry guys, I'm like combining my words tonight, of the vagina anus region or the penal and anus region for men. It is caused by the herpes simplex virus type 1 or type 2. So type 2 is strictly of the of the reproductive area, um, whereas type 1 is more associated with oral herpes, but type 1 can also cause genital herpes as well. But type 2 has not been documented causing oral uh, herpes yet doesn't mean that it's not possible, but if you are talking about genital herpes, it can be either type 1 or type 2. If you're talking about oral herpes, then it's type 1. The general signs and symptoms of primary infection, meaning when you first contract the virus, is that you will have these blisters on the reproductive area. There will be burning, pain, itching, um, Depending on the patient, they may even have some muscle aches or even a fever. So they will have this first outbreak or the primary infection. This is where the it's actually the worst outbreak, generally speaking, where it's the most painful and everything. And then what will happen is that it will be treated, the infection will go away, and it will go into something called a latent period. So this is where the um, virus will move into the nerves at the base of the spine and it's not causing any symptoms and it's the patient at that time is not um, quote-unquote contagious so they cannot transmit it. Now whenever a patient can transmit um, this infection to another partner is whenever they are actively having an outbreak, meaning that they have the pain, the sores, and everything, that's when they can transmit it. So that's when the patient should reside from sexual activity. And then also, roughly seven to 10 days after signs and symptoms have completely resolved. Because during that period, after the outbreak had occurred, they're undergoing something called asymptomatic shedding, meaning that they are getting rid of all the infected skin in that area 
And at that time, granted they have no signs or symptoms, they are actually still considered contagious and they can transmit it to their partner. So um, the virus is still alive inside those skin cells, although the body has fought off the infection, whether it be by itself or with some antiviral medication. Now what can happen is that after that um, latency period where there's no signs or symptoms, the patient is healthy, it can actually reoccur, meaning that you can have a reactivation of the virus, you can have another outbreak or another infection. Um, so what will happen is that if this does happen, it doesn't always happen, um, it will, the virus will travel from the nerves that it was residing in and travel back to the epithelial cells and cause an outbreak of sores. Generally, the outbreaks over time are much more milder, not so severe, and at that point manageable because the patient does know how to prevent reoccurring episodes as well as how to prevent spreading it to their partners. Um, so depending on the patient, um, they may be on something called a prophylactic treatment, meaning they take antiviral medication periodically um, if they have reoccurring outbreaks. Now, if the patient never experiences a reoccurring outbreak, then it's not necessary for them to be on antivirals daily. Now, with some patients, they do have severe outbreaks or severe reoccurring outbreaks where it's routine, kind of like what we saw with the UTIs, where it's like every three months or every six months they'll have an outbreak. And at that point, the physician may be like, let's put you on some antivirals in order to help your body and prevent this. But that varies from patient to patient. Now, also, HSV can actually infect the brain and that is known as herpes encephalitis. And with that, let's talk about neonate herpes. So this is where the virus can actually spread it to the infant or different parts of the um, infant's body, whether it be the brain, liver, lungs, kidneys. Now, um, this generally happens, neonate herpes generally happens whenever the mother is pregnant and then she becomes infected for the first time during pregnancy. This is where the neonate or the fetus is at higher risk. Now, if you have a patient that has been living with genital herpes and then becomes present, the risk of neonate herpes is definitely a lot lower. Now, it does not mean it cannot happen. So, if neonate herpes is going to happen after the fact where it doesn't cross the placental barrier, where this will happen is during delivery. So um, mothers that have HSV or have genital herpes, they can give vaginal birth if there are no signs of an outbreak. And then also during the third trimester, a, wom a woman, <laughs> um, the mother may be treated with antivirals such as like Valtrex or Alcyclovir in order to suppress the virus and make it safer for delivery. So during the third trimester, if the mother is not already on a prophylactic antiviral treatment, the doctor may prescribe it for the last um, trimester in order to prevent neonate herpes and then also to allow her the opportunity to deliver vaginally. Now, if there are signs and symptoms of an outbreak during delivery time, then a lot of times the doctor will tell her that she needs to have a cesarean, which is um, where she doesn't deliver vaginally, where she goes into surgery and um, the baby is taken out, essentially, in order to prevent that vertical transmission from mother to child. But um, completely manageable. Um, I believe that's all I'm going to say about herpes. Sorry, guys, I love herpes, if y'all haven't noticed. But let's go ahead and talk about HIV, my least favorite virus. Um, we've already talked about it a little bit, but just a little recap. HIV is an RNA virus. Um, it is a primarily sexually transmitted. So it's a transmitted either vaginally, orally, or anally. Or it can be transmitted without sexual contact through bodily fluids or through um, blood contact or um, through drug use, 
like uh, sharing of needles. So what happens is that HIV infects the CD4 T cells and it will replicate very, very rapidly producing billions upon billions of itself within the blood system. Now there is something called a viral load, meaning um, what is the concentration of virus present inside the blood. Now with that, with um, HIV, there are four stages. So as you progress, as your viral load gets higher and higher, that is whenever you um, go into the status of AIDS. So there is something called the primary infection. Oh, I'm sorry. So when you first become infected with HIV, you're in the primary stage, which is where you're normally asymptomatic. So meaning that you have no signs or symptoms, you don't know that you have HIV at that point. Um, but it is possible to have some signs or symptoms such as like a fever, a rash, or some inflammation present in your lymphatic system. Now there's something called clini clinical latency. So this is where your T cells slowly start declining and a lot of times there are no symptoms present as well. So some patients don't know that they have HIV until later on. Now where people do know that they have HIV very early on is whenever they found, found out that they, we are put at risk for it, such as if they have um, relations with an HIV positive partner. So something may have happened where they know that their partner is HIV positive, but maybe um, the condom breaks during, during intercourse and then that's whenever the patient wants to get tested. Um, roughly about a month after being exposed is whenever you can first detect it. So just depending on circumstances. Now you have something called early symptomatic diseases. So this is where a lot of times there are um, secondary infections that are occurring because of the fact that your CD cells, your CD4 cells are depleting. So a lot of times patients will um, have reoccurring oral thrush, so a um, candida infection of the throat, or um, reoccurring vaginal or listerosa, or a shigella. Um, also sometimes patients will have diarrhea and fever, but that's not as common. So at that point, normally your CD cell count is above 200. Now whenever your CD4 cell count block, drops below 200, this is where you enter AIDS. And a lot of times um, patients will be very sickly because of the fact that they can't fight off infections. And then sometimes they may even get a form of of Kepsi sarcoma, which is a form of cancer, um, but a lot of times patients with AIDS will get pneumonia a lot of times. And unfortunately, eventually they may even pass because of that secondary infection because of HIV AIDS. Because it's actually not HIV or AIDS that actually kills you, it's the secondary infection because you can't fight off other um, bacterial or um, viral infection or because you develop cancer and unfortunately at that time it's very difficult for you to undergo cancer treatments because it will weaken your immune system even more. Okay, so with that, let's talk about treatments really quick. Um, for HIV, there is something called HEART. So this is where it's highly active antiretroviral therapy. So these, this is like a combination of a bunch of medications. So what it does is that it will actually stop the virus temporarily from multiplying within the blood. And with that, it will reduce viral load. So at that point, your CD cell count can increase, which allows you to have better immune function. So improves um, the fact that you can fight off infections much more readily. And then also it can actually prevent transmission, so meaning that you can have a very active sexual life um, with your partner. And then also it can reduce the severity of other complications and then increase um, survival rate. So you can live years and years and years with HIV now and not go into AIDS. So it definitely um, increases somebody's longevity. So it, it allows somebody to have the life that they deserve. Okay, so now we're gonna talk about syphilis. So syphilis is not as common, but it definitely happens. So syphilis is caused by T. platium. 
I believe that's how you call it. Um, syphilis can cross the placental barrier and cause um, congenital syphilis. But what syphilis does is that it will invade the mucosa layer and it spread through sexual contact. And there's multiple stages of syphilis. So there's the first stage, which is incubation. So this is where you um, first contract it and it will start spreading throughout your body. And that normally takes about one to two months. And then you'll enter something called primary syphilis. This is where you will have the inflammation at the, at the site of infection causing a, oh, excuse me guys, got the hiccups, causing a, I believe you pronounce it a charini. <laughs> um, that's probably not even close. We're, ca we're gonna call it a chan, causes chan, um, which is normally painless, but it's very hard and it will contain the microorganism present. And then there's something called the latency stage. So this is approximately five years after contracting syphilis. And at this point, um, symptoms, they are absent, but um, an, infected an infected patient can develop a rash. And then tertiary syphilis is where there's um, some cardiovascular and neurological symptoms associated. And there is something called a, a soft growth or a gumma, gummas. And this is often found um, on the liver, the mouth, bone, brain, or skin area. And then patients will also um, have cognitive decline, which will can develop into dementia. And then another thing that can happen is um, associated with neurological is mood changes. So they can become severely um, um, kind of, they'll have um, like bipolar um presentation so like extreme mood changes so they can be very very depressed or even very very aggressive and then eventually unfortunately pass away from the disease um with syphilis it was actually very very common so just a little history guys very very common back in the day that is actually why a lot of old photographs of like English monarchs had a lot of makeup on them because they were trying to cover up the syphilis rash and um, lesions present on their face and mouth. And then also they also got lesion because lesions on their face and neck area because there was lead present in the in the makeup that they were using. So it was just a bad downward spiral. So they were just introducing more and more issues to their body, but they were wearing a lot of makeup in order to cover up the syphilis. Um, so this is just some clinical presentations of it. So this is actually the microorganisms. So like those little spirals right there, that is the bacteria. Um, the the charn, I can't even say it, the chan, the primary syphilis is this. So this is where it's like painless rash, um, nothing um, painful about it. It's just a macular rash. And then we have, um, as you see right here on the penis, it can also cause it on the penal head. And this can also be present in women as well. It's not just um, men is affected in the general region. And then this is a gumma right here where it's the soft tissue is damaged because of tertiary syphilis. So. I'm sorry guys, this is the Chan. I'm so sorry, I flipped these pictures. <laughs> so this is the Chan right here from primary syphilis and then this is the macular rash. So sorry guys. Okay, so now let's talk about gonorrhea. So gonorrhea is also known as the clap or, um, yeah, we'll just call it the clap from here on out. It is caused by N. gonorrhea. It is a gram-negative diplococcal um, bacteria so symptoms generally happen after a week being exposed. Some people exhibit, exhibit them a little bit um, sooner, but it can take as long as 30 days to develop. Um, most infected are men. They will exhibit symptoms more readily than women. And for men, they will experience painful urination. They will have discharge from their penis. Um, sometimes their testicles and penis may even actually swell depending on how their body reacts. But for the most part, the hallmark for men if they have gonorrhea is the discharge from the penis. Now with um, women, it is common in women as well, 
but women generally tend to be more on the asymptomatic side, meaning that they don't really show any symptoms, but if they do so show symptoms, then it's very similar to men presentation with the painful urination as well as discharge. Um, sometimes the infection can actually even spread further into the other reproductive organs. Um, this is primarily for women. Um, this will go into, it can cause further infection in the, in the uterus or the fallopian tubes, and at that point, um, it's something called PID or pelvic inflammation disease. So it will cause severe pain, and then actually, if PID is not treated, it can actually cause some fertility issues. So this is just a picture showing um, that an infection is present, but is also asymptomatic. So a woman, she may not know that she has it, but upon having a pelvic exam, the doctor may notice that her cervix is inflamed, as you see right here, that red protrusion, as well as the cervix is actually inflamed as compared to right here. So this is a normal cervix, kind of um, donut-like whereas you can slightly see the opening into the uterus, whereas right here you can see that it's very inflamed, very red and very pink, and you can't see the opening as readily. So this is how a woman is asymptomatic, but still has an infection present, and that's why it's very important to get a pelvic exam routinely for women. Okay, so now let's talk about chlamydia. So chlamydia is um, also a bacterial infection. So there are multiple different stereotypes um, for chlamydia. So chlamydia um, species can cause infection of the reproductive tract or also of the eye, which we saw a few chapters back. Um, but chlamydia is probably the most frequent one that is transmitted in US. And a lot of times people are unaware that they actually have chlamydia because of the fact that um, normally people are asymptomatic and primarily women. Um, so with having chlamydia, sometimes discharge may be present. Um, it just kind of depends. So some women may have some discharge, um, but in order to confirm if chlamydia is present, a PCR must be run, which is a type of test. Um, if left untreated, it can actually turn into P PID as well. Um, for men, though, it can cause um, testicular infections and then sometimes actually even turn into arthritis in the reproductive area, which I don't know how that happens, but I thought that was a fun fact to throw in. So with chlamydia, this is what he looks like. So. This is how it's actually transmitted. So what will happen is that um, it will be, it'll come in contact with one of our cells and then it'll replicate and then it'll cause even more attachment later on. Um, with um, transmitting though through sex, what can happen is that if a male, if your male, if there's a male partner present, what can happen is that chlamydia will attach to the sperm and whenever um, he ejaculates with his partner, then it can actually cause an infection that way. So um, it's called hijacking. So I thought that was, or hitchhiking, not hitchhiking, not hijacking. <laughs> um, hitchhiking, so the sperm is actually quote unquote infected and that is how the sexual partner can get it. And like I said, if it's left untreated, it can cause, um, secondary infection and in women it can cause PID which can lead to fertility issues further down the line. Okay, so how infection, how are infections transmitted to the, to the, uh, let me start over guys, sorry, I'm so tongue-tied. So non-sexually transmitted infections of the reproductive tract. How is that possible? So some genital infections within women can develop when sexual activity um, introduces a microbe um, on the perineum into the, into the vagina or during sexual intercourse. Um, also, 
if that does happen, it can cause something called um, a vaginal infection, which is known as vaginosis, or if it's vaginal inflammation, then it's vaginitis. And then this is very, very common in women, primarily in childbearing years. So normally, um, childbearing years is classified as from first period until she hits um, premenopause or menopause is considered childbearing years. Now, that varies between women, um, but generally it's around um, 14 to 45-ish, roughly. Um, some women can even go all the way up to 55, but it completely depends on the woman. And then also, hormonal changes because of menstruation and pregnancy can actually um, alter the microbiota of a woman. So let's talk about some vaginal infections. So let's talk about um, bacterial vaginosis. So this is where um, there is a bacterial infection within the um, vaginal canal. So there are normal microbes that reside there. And the most common one is known as lactobacillus. He's the most common one. Almost all of us have it. Some women have it more than others, but that is the normal flora of a, vag of a vagina. So um, the normal flora of, of the vagina will change during menstruation cycles, as well as based on the food that we intake. So generally, the vagina is considered acidic, and with the fact that it's acidic, it will inhibit growth. But there is that acid tolerant, meaning that he can live in acidic environments, and that's lactobacillus. And then what will happen is that if there is a bacterial um, infection of the vagina, normally it's caused because of lactobacillus, but that's not as common. Now, um, antibiotic treatments can cause lactobacillus to, to be inhibited, so cause him to die off. And with that, it allows the overgrowth of the yeast species known as candida. And normally it's caused by Canada albicans, he's the most common, but there are other Canada species that can cause it. So whenever a woman is taking antibiotics, let's say that she has a strep throat, she takes it and then sometimes a woman may experience a yeast infection afterwards because of the fact that lactobacillus is no longer present because of the antibiotics and at that point she may get a um, yeast infection caused by Canada albicans, which is a fungal infection. And then also, like I said, with bacterial um, vaginosis, it is not transmitted sexually, but sexual activity can be a risk factor. So um, women who tend to have multiple partners or um, are introduced to a new partner or they um, do douching, which is not good for the vaginal canal. So douching is where you are um, essentially stripping away your, norm, your natural flora of the vagina, which is not good. Your vagina is a natural cleaning machine. And then with douching, it allows lactobacilli to be stripped away. And then at that point, it allows overgrowth of other bacteria that should not be overgrowing that were originally in check because of lactobacilli. So with um, the overgrowth of any bacteria, it can cause signs of inflammation. Um, but in most, in most cases, there's, um, there's no other symptoms except for discharge. So um, if lactobacilli is not causing the infection, um, it can be caused by um, Garnelia vaginalis. So this is where... Um, if you do have a bacterial infection, it's probably caused by this guy. And then with him present, then you will have a, a foul odor to you, unfortunately. And then sometimes patient will even exhibit saying that I have um, pain while urinating or the vaginal region is extremely itchy. So that is a hallmark of um, bacterial vaginosis is the foul smelling. Okay. So with that, let's talk about um, vulvovaginal candidiasis. So this is where it's a yeast infection. So it's a it's not a bacterial infection. It is a fungal infection. So candida, like I said before many times, is that it is a normal microbiota of most women. Some women are more colonized than others, just depends. Um, 
but it is considered um, an opportunistic pathogen and it's not transmitted sexually. So what happens is that candida will overgrow because of either the patients being treated with antibiotics, birth control can also um, cause more yeast infections because of the hormone regulation. So candida is somewhat linked or associated with hormone fluctuation. Um, also because of diabetes, so poor diet, and then um, and then also because of the patient cannot regulate their sugars and Canada loves sugary, loves sugar environment. And then with that, that can put the, the woman at higher risk of getting a, a fungal or yeast infection of the vagina. So yeast infections are most common in childbearing years as are most vaginosis um, infections. Um, most women will experience it. It's completely normal. Um, you just take care of it. So you can actually take care of it with over-the-counter treatment or you can go to the doctor just depending on the severity of symptoms. But normally, um, if you go to the doctor and they say that you have a yeast infection, it's probably caused by Canada albicans. And then um, depending on what is causing the candidiasis, you may just alter it. So if you're just on antibiotic treatments, you'll finish your antibiotic treatments and then after that the yeast infection will resolve itself. Or if you get a yeast infection because of any excess external factors, then the doctor may actually prescribe you medication. Um, with uh, yeast infections though, there is discharge present, but there is no smell. So that is the difference between bacterial and fungal um, vaginal infections. So with bacterial vaginosis, you will have a foul smell, whereas with um, fungal or yeast infection, there will be no smell, but both of them will have discharge. Okay, um, so I just wanted to throw this in here. So this is just a pretty picture of Canada. He's so pretty. I'm sorry, guys. I love Canada. Um, he's my baby. So um, this is actually if a doctor were to tape take a scraping of the of the discharge this is what they would see underneath the microscope which is Canada albicans in this picture and then also this is what might be present inside of the vagina okay so with that that wraps up our lecture so we talked about the basic anatomy of um, the urinary system as well as the reproductive system. We talked about how to distinguish between infections. So I do expect you to know the signs and symptoms of each one for in terms of reproductive and urinary tract infections. Um, if y'all have any questions, definitely contact me. If not, I will see y'all in class and thank you for listening.